If you fly from London to Tokyo or you fly from New York to Beijing, you don't fly around the center of the earth, you fly a polar route, right? So why do we have ships that when they go from Hong Kong to Long Beach or when they go from Tokyo to get goods to Chicago, go the longest way instead of the shortest way? Well, the obvious answer is that the Arctic region and the North Pole is iced in most of the year. But uh, as uh, evidence has shown from scientists, the uh, glaciers and the ice has been consistently receding in the Arctic region over the past few years. And it's believed that by the year 2050, it's possible that in the month of September that there is no uh, significant ice flow in the Arctic region at all, which would enable ships to go from the port of Murmansk up into Canada, for example, to a place called Churchill in the Hudson Bay, drop off goods on a uh, train line that runs down to Winnipeg and ultimately Chicago, uh, thereby considerably saving the amount of cost and effort associated with that. Now, um, most of us in the room would probably say if the polar ice cap melts, we'd probably be focused on other things than improving the supply chain. Um, and uh, scientists and even supply chain experts will tell you that even if the pole were to freeze up or to unfreeze, um, it still wouldn't necessarily be an answer to all transportation problems because you'd have to navigate pretty slowly through that region and it'd only be open a couple, uh, couple weeks of the year. But what are other ways that we can get transportation to be faster? So if we're not going to take a ship around the northern part of Russia, and that this line is obviously exaggerated because uh, it doesn't reflect the curvature of the Earth, what about taking a train? It only takes two weeks to transport via rail freight uh, goods from China to Western Europe, but it takes six weeks to make the same trip uh, when you travel down around Singapore and under India and through the Suez Canal and through the Med up to the Western uh, European ports. So Deutsche Bahn, who's a German uh, rail company, actually opened up in 2008 a rail line that would run uh, through Mongolia and take advantage of the Trans-Siberian Railroad to take things over to St. Petersburg all the way over to Western Europe. There were some problems with it, though. The Russians and, and Finland use a different um, rail gauge than the rest of the world does. China and most of Western Europe are on a standard gauge, they're on a different gauge. It's hard to believe that any industry could run with multiple different standards, but the railroad industry does. Um, um, and uh, so effectively what you'd have to do is take all the uh, containers off of one type of rail car and put them onto another. The Russians will only let you use their, air, their rail cars, they want to inspect everything, and Deutsche Bahn as of now is really only running the service when it has enough demand. So that hasn't been particularly popular. But what about a road? I mean, after all, Marco Polo used to walk and carry perfumes and jewelry and other types of chemicals back from the Far East, um, back to Europe. Why can't we just build a road? And in fact, there is a road being built that's going to connect eastern China all the way to St. Petersburg, some 5,000 miles. Um, the most important part of which is a 1,700-mile stretch through a country called Kazakhstan. Now, most of you probably know Kazakhstan is the home of Borat, number one exporter of potassium. But it might, in the near future, be well known as uh, really the gateway between Asia and Europe. And this is a significant civil engineering project. It's costing $7 billion. It's backed by the World Bank and the Russian government. Uh, but the temperatures in these places are reach 120 degrees during the day. Um, there really is no infrastructure around it. So it's a particularly challenging thing. But it's expected to open in 2013. Now, when Marco Polo traveled the Silk Road, one of his biggest concerns was theft and having bandits approach him and try to steal his goods. It's hard to believe that in 2011 that we still have the same type of problem. There have been over 50 hijackings last year um, in the Gulf of Aden and off the coast of Somalia where pirates uh, captured ships and demanded ransoms. Probably the worst one from a supply chain standpoint was back in 2009 when they captured the Maersk, Alabama that had 17,000 tons of cargo and they had to negotiate for their release. And as you all know, this has been wreaking havoc with supply chains, particularly between Asia and Europe, because folks are going around the Cape of Good Horn in South Africa. Insurance premiums are up. Um, but cargo theft is not only a problem over in Africa, it's a big problem here in the United States as well. Incidents of cargo thefts have gone up 30% since 2007. So there are organized crime groups that go around to rest areas and truck stops and warehouses around the United States and they wait for a trucker to leave his rig, go inside um, to take a shower or get something to eat. Um, and it takes them about 30 seconds to hot wire the rig, drive it about 30 miles away, switch the rig, paint over the logo on the side of it, deactivate the homing, and the G homing devices and the GPSs, and they're off to sell this stuff down to South America at a huge margin. 
Now, they're targeting high-value goods, things like cosmetics, high-end apparel, electronics, pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals cause a big problem, though, particularly ones that are sensitive to temperature and humidity, right? Because we have a very sophisticated cold chain that ensures the integrity of those medicines and vaccines and drugs um, to keep all of us safe that take them. But you can't rely on criminals to actually abide by those rules. So when a $10 million worth of pharmaceuticals gets stolen in a truck, you might have to pull everything in the lot that was manufactured around the same time frame completely off the market just to be safe which could cost up to $50 million um, in losses. There was actually an incident uh, in 2010 where some um, organized crime members went onto the roof of an Eli Lilly facility and cut a hole in the roof and rappelled down the side, opened up the back door, backed up a truck, and unloaded $70 million worth of merchandise. So this is actually a growing problem here. So if we're not going to have a railroad across Asia and we're not going to go uh, through the Arctic, probably the biggest impact to global trade efficiency in the next couple of years is the expansion of the Panama Canal. So back in the 1930s, there was an effort underway to add a third set of locks uh, in Panama. It was abandoned because of World War II, but it's recently been restarted because of an issue that ships have gotten a lot bigger. Even as far back as the 1960s, a lot of the US military vessels couldn't go through the Panama Canal on their way over to the Korean War because they were too deep um, to navigate the can canal or they were too tall to fit under the Bridge of the Americas on the Pacific side of the canal. So what Panama is doing is they're adding this third set of locks. It'll be deeper, it'll be bigger, it'll be enable the biggest cargo ships in the world to be able to traverse through there. Um, and the reason they're doing this is they're actually losing a lot of business. These big cargo ships have just been taking goods to the western coast of the United States and putting them on a truck or putting them on a rail car and moving them to their final destination rather than going through the canal at all. So this will potentially be disruptive in, in terms of global trade. So we talked a lot about air and rail and ground transportation, but what about air transportation? You would think in the next 30 or 40 years we'd have some sort of supersonic, ultra-fast cargo carrier that can take goods from China to the US in a matter of a couple hours. Well, that's probably unlikely to occur. In fact, we're probably moving backwards, if anything, in the terms of, of airspeed, certainly since we uh, shut down the Concord service back in, uh, in 2003 after the crashes and things. Um, but what we did get was the Dreamlifter a pregnant version of the 747. Now, unfortunately, Boeing's only using it today to transport the wings and the various different parts of their Dreamlifter back and forth between places like Japan and Russia and Italy where they're manufacturing them uh, to the assembly facilities here in the United States. There was also a cargo version of the A380 that was supposed to launch the market, and they actually took orders but ultimately decided to suspend production on that um, before they delivered any. 